Michael Lofton is a Catholic apologist. He spends most of his time responding to radically traditionalist Catholics and Eastern Orthodox because rad trads like Taylor Marshall are basically schismatic in spirit when they call the Pope a heretic when they question the indefectibility of the church by doubting Vatican II and the Novus Ordo. And he is right. They aren't consistent with the Catholic worldview. And the rad trads vindicate Eastern Orthodoxy. And then against the Eastern Orthodoxy, he says, our magisterium isn't clear. Oh, we need Catholicism, we need the papacy, or we can never Wrong. have any certainty. But this just is not true. I know because I used to be a trad Catholic. And I'm going to show you 10 clear as day contradictions in Roman Catholic teaching. Number one, no salvation outside the church. You can read the Council of Florence. You can read Unum Sanctum. They clearly say there is no salvation outside the Supreme Pontiff. Every creature needs to be joined to the Supreme Pontiff. Even if you have shed blood in the name of Christ, you cannot be saved. But then Pope Francis canonized as a saint and doctor of the church, an Armenian, Gregory of Narek, who died 500 years after the Armenians rejected the Council of Chalcedon. And canonizations are infallible. So even the papacy teaches that there is salvation outside the church, contradicting Florence and Unum Sanctum. Number two, cremation. You can read any church father, any council, medieval saint, they were all against the medieval practice of cremation. But in 1963, the Vatican lifted the ban on cremation. So is cremation right or wrong? Until 1963, it was wrong because it was a condemned pagan practice. But now Catholics can get cremated and our bodies are made in the image of Christ. How can this be permitted? Number three, abolishing limbo. Since the 13th century, Catholic dogma has been limbo does exist. Until modern times, they had a three-year theological commission, and then Benedict in 2007 abolished limbo after 800 years of the Catholic Church teaching that there was limbo. But then the Pope can say, actually, there's no limbo. So the Pope has the power to abolish limbo and say it doesn't actually exist. This is exactly why atheists think Catholicism is a joke because a pope can come along and reject 800 years of teaching on limbo. So does limbo exist or not? It was dogma for 800 years. All this does is fuel atheism because the atheists say, oh, Christianity is just about fear, just like purgatory. Oh, you have to pay your way into heaven to get an indulgence. Oh, and now a pope, after making everyone fearful of limbo, can now abolish it. This Number four, interfaith gatherings. You can read Mortilio Animus. It says that apostolic see has never allowed for the participation in non-Catholic assemblies. This is an encyclical, which means it's ordinary magisterium. According to Vatican I, that needs to be believed as divinely revealed. So did John Paul II and all these past saints not hear about this encyclical when they do a cc1 a cc2 they have pachamama at the vatican they're building an abrahamic faith center when benedict goes into a mosque and does the muslim prayer when he goes into a synagogue and prays with them as they pray for their messiah their messiah already came or when they go into a buddhist temple or a hindu temple this is clearly a contradiction and for Tilly Tucci, which preaches human dialogue and fraternity instead of converting people, and has a not only a, an ecumenical prayer, which you can't pray with heretics, but also a prayer to a generic creator, where they're trying to expand the boundaries to not only uh, non-Catholics, but also non-Christian. And this goes to point five on non-Christian religions. You can read Pope Leo in Ad Extremis, where he says Hinduism is deprived of all truth versus Vatican II and Nostra Aetate. It is literally a day and night difference on what the Catholic Church teaches about Hinduism. And not only on Hindus, but also on Muslims. You know, the Catholic Church used to call crusades, but now they're having these interfaith gatherings. They're building an Abrahamic faith center, and they're saying that they all worship the same God. In an ecumenical council, in Vatican II, it says that Muslims worship the same God as Christians. We don't worship the same God. Number six, the death penalty. You can read the church fathers. You can even read medieval Roman Catholic saints like Thomas Aquinas defending the death penalty as a form of divine justice and using scripture to defend it. And even in the 20th century, you could read Pope Pius, who has a full doctrine defending capital punishment. But now in the modern Roman Catholic Church, Pope Francis has officially changed the catechism and changed Catholic teaching that it is against the gospel to be for the death penalty. 
So how at one point could the death penalty be a part of divine justice and be biblical, but now Pope Francis in the modern church can say it is contrary to the gospel. It is inadmissible. Which one? Number seven, religious liberty in getting rid of confessional Catholic stains. Pope Pius was very clear in his syllabus of errors that there is no like natural rights. There are only divine rights by God. Men do not have a natural right to worship whatever God. There is religious tolerance, but religious liberty has never been Catholic. Versus in Dignitas Humanis, Vatican II, it clearly says that religious liberty must become a, a civil right. And we have seen this take place all across the Catholic world, Catholic countries making religious liberty a civil right, getting rid of confessional states, all because of the Vatican. It's a contradiction. The state and the church used to always work together in, in the history of the church. But now, because of Vatican II, they are separate. It's a secularization of the Catholic Church coming from the top, coming from Vatican II and Ecumenical Council. Number eight, Amoris Laetitia. From the Council of Trent in the 1500s to Pope Francis in 2015, the Catholic Church has never allowed for divorce and remarriage and then to receive communion. It was always a mortal sin. It was always an excommunicatable offense in the Roman Catholic Church since Trent. But then Amoris Laetitia in 2015, now Francis, Catholic dogma changes where they allow the divorced and remarried to receive communion. So which one is it? Some people even wrote a letter accusing Pope Francis of heresy. So who is right? The current Pope or the past Popes from Trent to 2015 or 2015 on, or maybe before Trent. Which teaching is the Catholic teaching if it's so clear? Nine, changing the mass. You can read Pope Pius V in Quo Primum where he says the Latin mass is forever, but then Pope Francis now says with certainty and with magisterial authority, the liturgical reforms are irreversible, the Novus Ordo. So which one is it? You have two Popes saying that their changes are irreversible, but they, they change. So really, the sole interpreter of tradition and divine law and the liturgy, the continuity, is literally up to the newest pope. It's not about continuity or truth. Number 10, an imperfect communion and being outside the church. Pope Leo is so clear in Sagnis Cognitum. If you depart on one point of the faith, you are an alien to the church. You are outside of the church. Versus Vatican II, it just says if you're baptized, then you're in, your, you're in communion with the Catholic Church, although an imperfect communion. But this never existed. Either you're inside the Catholic Church or you're not. This is an entirely new doctrine. And you can see this in their canon law where they even allow Eastern Orthodox to receive their sacraments, which makes no sense because I, an Eastern Orthodox, am a schismatic, yet I have an imperfect communion and I can receive their sacraments. This makes no sense. It's a contradiction. I could go on and on, but this papacy, this universal super bishop, pre-schism popes, pope saints, specifically warned about a universal bishop in Vatican I. And even Pope Benedict has admitted that the Orthodox view was the norm in the first millennium of the church. And if you read neutral books on the papacy, if you read neutral books on the filioque, it is very clear that Rome has been the church that's innovating. It says all these new doctrines that they added, like papal infallibility, papal supremacy, the filioque, are completely Wrong. foreign. But by far, the biggest contradiction is the Eastern Catholics. They alone refute Rome because it shows Rome doesn't care about doctrinal or theological unity. They only care about a superficial unity, about submitting to the Pope. After that, you can do whatever. Because Catholic canon law talks about the age of reason and why kids get confirmed later and they can't receive, you know, why they don't have infant communion. Versus the Eastern Catholics, like the Eastern Orthodox, chrismate babies so they can have infant communion. The Eastern Catholics, like the Orthodox, have married priests, even though Catholic canon law banned married priests. The Eastern Catholics do not recite the filioque. They want it removed. They don't recite it. Versus in the West, they recite the filioque. They don't even have the same creed. And they don't even do the sign of the cross. They don't even... The Eastern Catholics do it like the Orthodox. From right to left versus the West, they do it the other way. And this stuff matters. The outward expression is reflective of what you believe inside. And it shows that Rome doesn't care. The Eastern Catholics venerate post-schism saints, even a pillar of orthodoxy, Gregory Palamas. How does that make any sense? He was so anti-filioque, but now he can be a Roman Catholic saint. He can be venerated by Eastern Catholics. It doesn't make any sense. This is so ironic because Michael Lofton, just like many other Catholic apologists, go to an Eastern Catholic parish. So doesn't that say a lot that the only good thing left in the Catholic Church is in the Eastern part, in the part that is closest to the Orthodox? And if that is true, why not just become Orthodox? 
all of this extra Western baggage that is not needed. In his whole argument, oh, we need Catholicism and the papacy for certainty. But no, it doesn't. You have to buy all these books. Can the Catholic magisterium contain errors? Oh, actually, no, that, that you can't read this book. That's recognize and resist. So you have to read, oh, the Pope, the Council and the Mass, James Lakotis. But you read him and you look up James Lakotis and he is a modernist. He, he praises John Paul II for his ecumenism. One only has to read the magnificent writings of Pope John Paul II, who's a great ecumenist, the greatest <gasps> ecumenist of our day, and he tells you what real, genuine ecumenism is. And in these two marvelous writings, at Unum And I'm not saying the Eastern Orthodox don't have problems. We have lots of problems, but his whole appeal is that Catholicism, it brings certainty and unity. But no, it doesn't. I just gave 10 clear as day examples of the Roman Catholic Church contradicting itself. And it's sad because the only good thing left in the Catholic Church is the Eastern part. And it doesn't make any sense. They should just become Eastern Orthodox. And all of this vindicates Eastern Orthodoxy. So now let's see what he said on Matt Frad's show. Orthodox, I would find an answer. Um, one of those issues was how does the teaching authority of the church work? How can I objectively know what is right yeah. versus wrong? Um, do do I is artificial contraception wrong? You know, in orthodoxy is, is um, what is an ecumenical council? How do I know what is definitive and what is not? What is binding on me? What is not? Mm. Those were all questions that I was asking because, as somebody who's orthodox, I want to live my faith in accordance with what the church tells me to believe. Mm -hmm. So when I start asking those practical questions, I just continue to see problems. And I, it's That same exact reasoning is why I left Catholicism. I didn't know what was binding, what wasn't. And it was so confusing because of all the contradictions. There all, isn't all these contradictions in Orthodoxy, but in Catholicism, I just went over just 10 of them. There is so many more where not only it clearly def it defines something, and then it contradicts it. So you don't get that just because you have the papacy. And it really does seem like it's his own scrupulosity that is causing him to go to Catholicism. And all of us struggle with scrupulosity. Like, am I doing this right? Is this the right thing? But it's but at the end of the day, you have to trust in God. But it, this isn't solved by becoming a Catholic. Would see, I would continue to see strength for, you know, the Catholic position here and a, an ongoing deficiency. Uh, an ever more increasing deficiency um, in orthodoxy. And there were other things that were going on at the time in orthodoxy that really just pointed out the need for the orthodox to be able to have an objective magisterium and an objective, objectively identifiable teaching authority. Mm -hmm. And it just, I wasn't seeing answers and I, I wasn't seeing it um, they're in Eastern Orthodoxy. So it seems like he was attracted to Catholicism because of what the papacy could offer him. Certainty. He doesn't have to be scrupulous. He can just trust in the Pope. But as we can see, that isn't Wrong. the case. It would be nice if we did have one person, like a Pope, who had a special charism and he was completely infallible and we could just trust that guy. But that's just not how the world works. You know, the papacy is an innovation propped up on forgeries. It is not something that is present in the early church. There was no Vatican I papacy. Papacy. It was something that evolved over time and it is continuing to evolve. Maybe a papacy sounds nice on paper, paper so we can have certainty, but that is not the reality. In the reality, we can't put our faith and hope in a man, the Pope. You can only put your faith in God. And that's the really fundamental problem is that the Pope has replaced Christ in the Catholic Church. Yeah, somebody say like the Protestants were so divided so I became Catholic and I'm like, yeah, but look at us. Like it's nice to pretend that we're all united but in actuality have a look. There's a lot of fracturing going on. There's a lot yeah, of infighting yeah. going on. And I imagine someone might have a similar objection when you say, you know, I wanted to know where is the definitive teaching but then mm -hmm. Catholics in today's day and age are also struggling mm -hmm. with, with that about mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of different issues. You know, mm -hmm. they might say, well, my bishop actually says it is okay. I appreciate Matt Frad for being honest. Being in the Catholic world, it is not united. It is super divided, especially the people who take it the most seriously, who are the most traditional, they are so divided because they can't make sense of the craziness that is going on. I mean, I went over just 10 of the contradictions. There are many more, but having to make sense of all those, it literally makes you go insane. 
it makes you like schizophrenic when you're like, oh, we need the Pope. We need to be in communion with the Pope and submit to the Pope. But the Pope is also, uh, he's preaching heresy. It's a total contradiction. It literally makes you mad. And you can see the way the Catholic Church is going. They're going to have a female diaconate. They're going to have a female priesthood. They are continuing down the path of modernism because they are built on evolution of dogma. <laughs> What is an ecumenical council? They'll go through all the theories and they themselves huh. will point out none of these work. And and so that's why you have figures like um, Florovsky in orthodoxy who wants to just say, um, look, there's no objective way to identify an ecumenical council. An ecumenical council is a spontaneous event of the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. I, I know a whole lot of Protestants who can make that same argument. So that doesn't really give me an objective answer on how to determine what is right, what is wrong, what is definitive, what is not objectively. If we're just relegating this to some kind of subjective mm -hmm. um, movement of the Holy Spirit, uh, because anybody can claim that they're on board with the Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. um, that clearly did not work. So a lot of Orthodox will admit they don't have an objective way to identify an ecumenical council. And I will then compare that to Catholicism. It spends a lot of time on what is an ecumenical council. If I could just know this, then I could be Orthodox. Well, it's been defined and he just brings up, oh, look at these two people. Okay, you can listen to other people. Two people aren't the Orthodox Church. You, Ubi Petrus has a great article on this, answering this question. It does have an objective way, and that's through papal ratification. So if the Pope is receiving it as an ecumenical council, you can consider it an ecumenical council. Um, it identified definitive teachings in Catholicism versus Orthodoxy. So yes, maybe not everything has been settled to date mm -hmm. in Catholicism. Ah, but it has the structure but, but in place to do it. we have the ability to settle issues when needed. Mm -hmm. so but this isn't fixed with a papacy, especially when the newest pope contradicts the prior teaching. Like saying, oh, now this liturgical reform is irreversible. Oh, now the death penalty is contrary to the gospel. Oh, now divorce and remarriage, that's okay now. So who do you trust then when it seems like the pope is contradicting the prior teaching? You have to blindly follow the pope. Versus in orthodoxy, like I said, we have problems. But most of the problems can be resolved via local synod. And, I, and again, everything gets resolved with time. Trust in your local local bishop and let the holy spirit guide you that's what all of the church fathers say is trust your bishop but also you know do your research let the holy spirit guide you but it's not by having this office of the papacy you don't do that you just you can blindly follow the pope you can't because the pope like i said with all this has clearly contradicted the prior teaching he's trying to sell you on something that does Wrong. not exist and we can see that the papacy on paper it sounds all nice but the papacy in action does not bring the epistemic certainty that he is trying to sell you I, protestants orthodox catholics would all say that catholics teach the immaculate conception as definitive yeah. protestants and orthodox may or may not agree with it most protestants wouldn't some orthodox might agree with it some wouldn't but they would at least say that, yes, Catholics do teach that definitively, right? Mm -hmm. So even they know that we have the ability to definitively teach something in Catholicism. Um, whereas if you were to ask that same question in, in Eastern Orthodoxy, is this, is this true? Um, you're you're going to get different answers from different or Fun exercise. Ask a Catholic if Vatican II is an ecumenical council. <laughs> Oh no, it's a pastoral council. Oh no, he didn't. This wasn't said ex cathedra. Oh, it can contain air. Oh, they come up with all these mental gymnastics. Oh, but I thought you said it was so clear. But your latest council, and probably one of the most influential councils in the history of the Catholic Church, no one even knows if it's ecumenical. So which one is it? You have to get all these books to try and understand it. So again, what he's trying to sell you just is not true. Now, what I think an Orthodox could do is say, Yes, maybe you as Catholics do have an objective way to identify, you know, what's definitively taught in your communion. Maybe you do have that, but that's not the structure that Christ gave us. You know, the Mormons might actually have an objective mm -hmm. teaching authority, an objective magisterium, but that doesn't mean Christ established the Mormon church, right? So just because you have that objectivity doesn't necessarily mean mm. it's a slam dunk. For there we go. He just answered the question. Another fun exercise is ask a Catholic how many ex cathedra statements. Because what he was talking about, the Immaculate Conception, that was the only thing that's ever been an ex cathedra statement, according to some people. Some people claim the ex there's 
hundreds of ex cathedra statements so which one is it again it doesn't bring the certainty but if you ask someone hey, do the orthodox church believe in the seven mysteries yes do we believe in bishops yes we have certainty again it's his personal scrupulosity he is scrupulous about certain issues and so that's why he can't be orthodox because we have this objective thing in the catholic church well, you it don't you don't really, and then, and then what do you do when it contradicts the prior teaching? Are you just supposed to submit to it? It seems like that's what a Catholic should do when it clearly contradicts itself, like I talked about in this video. Overall, leave a like if you, if you enjoyed the video. Let me know if you have any questions about Catholic versus Orthodox. I can respond to more Michael often because he makes a lot of videos about Eastern Orthodoxy. Or if you want me to respond to anyone else, thank you. God bless.